Attention listeners, AfterSight's annual hike is coming up on July 27th. It was a really good experience for me. Visit AfterSight.org slash hike and become an audio trekker today. That hike today gave me so much courage. You're listening to an AINC original podcast. We believe you don't have to do life without a compass. Let us be your guide on this amazing journey. Welcome to Navigating Life with Vision Loss. Hello, this is Kim Wardlow. I'm your host. Uh, This month in May, we are looking at mental health. We're going to be talking about various um, aspects of mental health, having various discussions surrounding a few key areas. Those will include medications, depression, loneliness. Um, But beginning this month, we're going to be talking about addiction. Um, Our host is no stranger to this subject area, Bill Lundgren. He's the host of our podcast, Blind Sight, and has been in counseling um, for many, many years. Uh, Bill, Welcome to the program and to the podcast. Um, so, Bill, with so many years of experience, um, you must have seen almost everything and so many different types types of situations uh, that people were going through. So, I'm I'm excited to to pick your brain and get some information for our listeners today. I feel like addiction is such a a broad topic, and that there's People are addicted to different types of um, things. There's different addictions. There's different levels of addiction. Some people have addictions, but they're still very high functioning. Um, Can you give us some general information about the common threads um, of different addictions that you've helped people with in the past? Well, I'd like to uh, kind of define addiction much more broadly than most people, uh, and that is is a uh, uh, distorted uh, experience and and drive towards a mind-altering experience. In other words, we can be addicted to running, to work, to a lot of things which are socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. But what we talk about and what people come in for, of course, is to the illegal substances and the legal substance, the largest one of which is alcoholism. It's still the number one addiction uh, because it's socially acceptable and, you know, and it gets us into a lot of trouble. And when we do reporting about in the blindness community, Uh, It's interesting to me that we talk about people with blindness are three times more likely to be alcoholics than those who without a disability. And one of the things that's interesting, besides the fact that it's a high rate, uh, back in the days when I started counseling, I was working with LGBT people because nobody else was. And it was the same kind of ratio, in other words, three times higher rate of addiction in that community as in the uh, rest of the population. But it's still a high number, and uh, we continue to struggle with it. And when I go around to conferences and I ask treatment programs, you know, how many blind people, or people with blindness do you see? And people tell me, uh, no one. And when people, when I go to uh, professional workshops, I'd be the only person with a disability, let alone blindness, that would show up. So something's a little off. But in terms of addiction, uh, you know, the we talk a lot about Sentinel, which is a very potent uh, drug, which is being mixed with others. Uh, I don't have any statistics about uh, the blind, uh, community of blind people, but I do know that you know that's been a major concern because it's so deadly. The thing that I think we need to pay attention to, uh, not so much of the 
particular substance, though, each one, there are some variables. In other words, if I'm working with someone who's a sex addict, you know, it's different. Or someone who is uh, a gambler. Interestingly enough, uh, they find in brain scans that uh, the brain scan of someone who's a gambling addict uh, who goes into a casino, the brain scan is the same as for someone who is a cocaine addict. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's a thread in all of this in something in addiction that is the altering of the brain's uh, responses. And that gets very, you know, the reward system is you feel so uh, departed from what you started with that you want more and more of it. And right. when you stop uh, using the substance, then a lot of times, it, particularly with like cocaine or meth or some of those, uh, you may go into depression which and you try to treat depression. And then at the same time, uh, not to confuse the issue, but oftentimes it's depression, which is generating the need for substance abuse or for uh, getting into the addiction. So we have, we now call a dual diagnosis that in order to get somebody clean and sober, we have to deal with the depression as well. So, you know, it, it's not as simple as saying, okay, I'm addicted to this experience. It's the mindset of the person to begin with that we have to look at. And that they, you know, it seems to be a pretty universal trend towards the depression. Mm-hmm. And if if you're a friend or a family member and you are starting to question whether your loved one has an addiction, you know, is it just, I mean, some things I think if if there's drugs or substances involved, People may have a better sense of that, but um, what are what are some symptoms that people might be able to identify? Well, the 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 uh, ways of identifying, but I want to start with something even more potent, and that is there's a, a lot of enabling that goes on. Mm, yes, uh, I've heard people say, "I would drink if I were blind." Or even one time, a, a friend of mine experienced being talking to somebody on a bus uh, about uh, her blindness, and the woman said, uh, "Just matter of fact, if I knew I was going blind, I would kill myself." Oh, That's my. the kind of attitude that you start with in people, family members, even who are in trying to identify if the person is in trouble with alcohol or any substance. But the issue, you know, the the identification has to do with uh, observing the person uh, when they drink, what's behind the drinking or or use of any substance, uh, trying to, you know, have, are you concerned about the person's behavior under the influence? Are they concerned about their use? You know, like somebody will say, uh, I guess I need to cut back on my drinking. That's a sign that something's going on Mm -hmm. and that something that has to be addressed. So it's kind of like uh, the family member has to get past the enabling, which is real tough. And they also have to... uh, you know, check, is, is this behavior from my partner or parent or whatever, is that, uh, quote, normal behavior? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, is that person using that substance in something that feels compulsive? You know, there's a difference between addictive drinking and social drinking. Mm-hmm. And if the person, if we're talking about alcohol, for example, if the person is having a few drinks before they go to a party, then something's going on there. And the issue really is for the person to, in a very matter-of-fact way, 
can raise the question with the person. The person will be very defensive. Mm -hmm. That's why we we, uh, uh, offer something called intervention, which is where uh, the family members, a whole group of family and friends, may get together with a therapist to talk about an intervention. But the key in the intervention, and always the key in the intervention, is to draw a line between the person's social uh, person's use of whatever and the problems that occurred. In other words, you say, you know, last Friday uh, you had X number of drinks before we went to Sally's party, and then at the party you did this, this, and this. Not in an accusing way, but just as a matter of fact, and say, you know, this is not normal behavior. And I'm, I'm concerned I love you. I, I'm concerned. I think we may need to uh, check out whether we have a problem here. And to, in a loving way to be able to state the facts so there's no argument. Say, look, this is what happened. And then to be able to uh, suggest and beforehand if the family feels that they have to do something to find a person that the uh, uh, therapist that the person can see and say, look, uh, there is Dr. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so is a specialist in this. Uh, Why don't you check it out? And even even if things have been uh, difficult to say, look, if you don't check it out, I can't be around you when you uh, drink or use that, that substance. It's just not safe. And so, in other words, there's both the uh, carrot and stick. Mm -hmm. You know, I love you, want you to make sure you're okay, but if you're going to continue this kind of behavior, I can't be with you. And would it be a similar approach if you were dealing with a different type of addiction, like you mentioned, gambling or shopping or... um yeah, I mean, something... like even even exercise, like you mentioned, running. If it's if it's affecting the person's health, or if there's a eating mm-hmm. disorder associated with that, um, right? Right. Like that. What you see the the thing is, there's an accusation, and the person say, "Oh, you're just you know." Say, look, this is abnormal behavior, eating disorder. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. saying, "I love you, I'm concerned, and this is the behavior that I'm observing." And then you say, you know, this is not, you know, it, in in my experience, this is not normal behavior. Mm-hmm. Would you be willing to talk with somebody about that? And, and you know, the person's going to be defensive. But if it's lovingly done, and you may have to do it several times to get, you know, get through. But just be real clear on what you're observing and not being accusatory, but just simply uh, saying this is the behavior, this is the consequence of the behavior, this is, you know, the consequence that I can't be with you, and then you go from there. And being able to to stick with that consequence, to, you know, if you say, well, I can't be around you when right. you do this, Absolutely, then because you, you have to your... really, really say, oh, you're doing this, I told you I can't be around you while you're doing this, yeah. so... Yeah, yeah, don't don't uh, suggest a consequence and not follow through because you lose your credibility. Yeah, I think I think th- that I could see where that might happen, where somebody's. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because you don't want to say I'm going to kick you out of the house. Right. You know that's not going to that's not going to do it. But you say, you know, I I can't be around you when you do this. And in the case of, of alcohol, for example, then you say, okay, I told you uh, I can't be around you. And, you, you know, you just simply leave for a little while mm-hmm. or you have to follow through. Otherwise, the intervention is uh, worthless. And so you have to be real careful about what you decide to do. Right, because you, you need to be able to follow through. You don't want to right. give right. a consequence that you're not actually willing mm-hmm. to live mm-hmm. with. <laughs> I want to go back a little to to finding treatment. So if the person says yes, 
I'm interested in finding, you know, getting help, seeking treatment. Um, how does a person go about doing that and finding a credible place to get treatment? And it's still in my mind what you mentioned earlier that individuals um, specifically as you're looking at statistics for individuals who are blind, not seeing, even though there's a higher percentage of people struggling with addiction, that doesn't equate in the figures that you see of people seeking treatment. Um, and does that have to do with accessibility to the treatment? I'm, I, uh, in terms of, of getting somebody to get a, effective treatment, Yes. Yeah, so, so if, if you have an intervention and, and the person agrees that they will, you know, that they will seek treatment, what are those, what are those next steps? Well, the, the step that you have to take beforehand, if you're doing that kind of intervention is check around to see who's available to see uh, someone or to go, if, if you decide, uh, Generally, a, a full intervention involves your therapist being there right in the beginning. And in fact, uh, a full-fledged in, intervention is in the therapist's office. And then uh, at that point, the, if things have gotten so bad, the uh, family has already arranged for a treatment program for the person to go into. And in fact, the suitcase is pa packed. Mm -hmm. But that's a, and that's more than most most people will do. The thing that's real important is to find who, uh, or maybe a couple names of people who might see the person with the problem for treatment. If it's an eating disorder, an eating disorder clinic. If it's a, an alcohol thing, a, a, a certified in, uh, uh, professional in the addiction field or a uh, psychologist and to uh, say, okay, this is the number of that person. Will you call that person and find out if you, if you have a pro if they think you have a problem, mm -hmm. in other words, to kind of take it out of your hands of making the diagnosis. And then uh, if the person doesn't follow through, just keep, you know, keep that, a uh, number handy and, you know, do a pretty regular uh, reminder. And the person eventually has to say, you know, especially when you give all the evidence that there's a problem there, they have to say, okay, I'll, you know, get her off my back. I'll go see someone. And there'll be real resistance. But if the person is a good therapist, they can deal with the resistance. But it's important to get someone and preferably someone, uh, you you know, you can call up and say, hey, do you have experience in working with people with blindness? And insurance companies, if you look for, through the profiles of possible uh, referrals, uh, you'll see some of them say, yes, they're uh, used to working with people with disabilities. That's one of mm -hmm. the categories they have uh, listed. And the uh, person therapist profile will include yes, they will work with this population. And that's a, a good indicator that you probably have someone nice to find a therapist who's blind, but right now we're not uh, having a, an easy way of finding them. Now, if uh, AfterSight can do the mental health resources we've been talking about, that would be one place that people could call us up and get some ideas of people to uh, talk to them at least. And that so would be a major service because uh, this is not readily available other than, as I say, an insur insurance uh, provider list that specifically says disabilities. Mm -hmm. But that would be something to look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does and exist. you hope, but if mm -hmm. not, you know, you're always free to call the office and say, look, uh, I want to make a referral to you. I'm a parent of, and uh, do you work with people with, with blindness or people with whatever physical disability just to be able to be sure that, uh, you know, they're going to be prepared. The other piece of it is that 
uh, interestingly enough, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, has come to the point where on their database for AA meetings, they ha- indicate what meeting sites are fully accessible. In other words, somebody in a wheelchair or somebody blind or whatever, they can, uh, they can attend the meeting without worrying about accessibility. Uh, the uh, Library for the Blind, you know, out of Washington, the uh, Library of Congress, has a number of the AA publication in uh, audio format or Braille format. So there's some resources. So if someone says, well, I'm blind, I can't go to such and such program. So, well, here, here's evidence that, it, that uh, they are accommodating. And the same, is, in the same way in terms of talking to treatment program, checking if somebody needs to, a rehab, checking that they are, uh, com- they are prepared to work with someone who has a vision problem or someone who has any kind of handicap because not everybody is. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great advice. And I think that could, could take a bit of, of work and research, especially depending where you are. Yeah. Um, Obviously there's, there are more options in, in metropolitan areas and rural areas. That's right. Um, And that's one of the the big problems we have now. uh, For example, treatment programs, uh, what we call intensive outpatient, and I'm talking alcohol because that's the, uh, the easiest to identify. <clears throat> a lot of them are virtual now. Okay, that was going to be my next question. If, if you are in an area where there isn't a place you can go um, in person, can you do that type of treatment virtually? And is right. it just as right. effective? We can, you can go online and be able to, uh, to get the information. See, one of the things that I've discovered uh, I, last year, I went to a conference at the treatment program. Nobody's seen a blind person. And lo and behold, I, uh, by talking with one of the coordinators of the conference, I was invited for the first time, apparently for the first time, to talk on this topic. But what it came, uh, what has led me to realize that nobody is offering workshops for therapists on the subject of disabilities. Now, I know in, in the result of uh, my presenting this year, there are a number of listeners to the, the Blind Sight podcast, I'm told, who attended and are looking for more information. But if we could have more of that, and we can have more people going out and talking to therapists about uh, the blindness population, the uh, population with uh, who have handicap of any kind, uh, <clears throat> then we can get things rolling. But right now, we've been in an invisible population. I don't have to tell you guys this. <laughs> and so that's part of the job that we have to have to be doing uh, in order to help uh, the population that we serve. But there's some out there We just need to uh, let people know about those resources so that they'll be hooked up with the right people. Well, that can make a huge difference for, for the person seeking treatment to feel, to feel more comfortable and, and not have lots of barriers. Yeah. I have to teach, teach therapists. I realized to treat people with blindness uh, in a way that responds if they bring in a guide dog, if they, you know, in terms of uh, assisting them, even in, from the waiting room into their office. Because people, you know, people tell me they had no idea. And so, and, and but there are some blind, there are a number of blind therapists in the area. There are a number of people who do know it just, you know, we need to connect them with the people that we care about. Is there any other um, advice that you would give give someone um, if either they're feeling like they need to seek treatment themselves, or if it's a, a family member who's who's well, I think been talking with somebody and and they're they're looking at treatment. Well, as I say, I think the biggest uh, the best piece of advice is to 
uh, stop the enabling from the people around the person with the problem. And that does, you know, it has nothing to do with disability enabling and just being afraid to say to the person, you know, I think you need help. It's the greatest service we can give people. To the person that's there that is in trouble, the thing that I think people need to understand that they, they can be helped and that the, the difficulty they're having is uh, treatable and that the fact that they're blind does not mean that they can't go out there and uh, do the things they want to do. And that has to do with both accepting themselves as, say, alcoholic or a drug addict or whatever it is, but also accepting themselves as a person with a disability. And that, you know, wh- where they stop seeing those things as a barrier and say, okay, this is who I am, and I still can do whatever it is that I want to do. I just need to take care of these two issues. Uh, that uh, I am allowing to hold me back. And it's a matter of saying, I, I will not be held back anymore. That's great advice um, for people, um, an encouragement for, for individuals that are seeking treatment to, to continue to seek that. If you, if the first uh organization or therapist you contact if you're not comfortable or you feel like they're not um, going to give you the accessibility that you need um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to not be discouraged and to keep keep seeking that that treatment. Absolutely. And I encourage you and the work you're doing too, Bill. That's great that you're actually educating other therapists about working with individuals with, with disabilities. So hopefully more um, individuals can, can get help and feel comfortable um, in getting that help. It's an important thing. I'm so, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to do this. Well, thank you, Bill, for joining us on the program. Thank you all for listening. Um, just a few announcements from, from After Sight for you. Um, Game Changers, the, for the first episode of that podcast will be June 6th. And we're excited to bring um, a podcast that's all about blind athletes and the various sports that they play. And uh, you might find out there's things that you can do that maybe you didn't think you could after losing vision loss. So uh, please tune in for that. And if you're up for trying to do a hike with us, our Audio Trekkers 2024 hike is this July 27th at Myers Gulch um, here in Boulder County. So we would love to have you join us. Um, You're able to uh, register online on our website, which is www.aftersight.org. If you have any questions coming up surrounding the topics of medication, depression, or loneliness, um, those will be covered in upcoming podcasts. Please give us a call at 720-712-8856, or um, you can email us with your questions at feedback at aftersight.org. We hope that the information that Bill has shared with you um, today helps you navigate your life with vision loss.